Okay. Let's get right into it. Om Namah Shivaya. Today, um, very, very important discussion. We're going to discuss the spanda. The spanda is a very technical term within the context of Kaula Trika Tantra or non-dual Kashmir Shaivism. And it means the playful, exuberant, self-expressive nature of pure consciousness. So the claim is that you are not the body, you are not the mind, and you are never any concept you can have about yourself. Rather, you are awareness. That much we know. We learned that from Sankhya, we learned that from Advaita Vedanta, we even to some extent learned that from Buddhism, from um, northern schools of Buddhism. Now, where Kashmir Shaivism, that is non-dual Shaiva Tantra, where it extends from these schools, is to say that this awareness that you are, beyond the body, beyond the mind, beyond any notion you can have about yourself, this very awareness, first of all, alone exists for its one and one alone, non-duality, um, of course, that you also get in Advaita Vedanta. We go one step further and we say that very awareness, which is non-dual, that pure conscious that you are, is endowed with an inherently playful nature. There is a kind of spiritual stirring within consciousness that demands a self-expression um, of its own blissful fullness. And so what ends up happening is that awareness, you, manifest yourself as the world that you see around you. So everything that you see is you blazing forth to present yourself to yourself for ever new self-discovery moments. So that, that's the claim of Kashmir Shaivism. So it's not quite like Ramanuja in the sense that awareness literally becomes everything, like milk literally becomes yogurt. Not quite. It's a bit more like the Vivarta Vada of Kevala Advaita in that the one awareness appears to become everything. But unlike Kevala Advaita, that one awareness manifests itself as a real manifestation around you. So these are all technical terms, and necessarily those of you who are academically interested in the subject, those of you who are interested to see how Kashmir Shaivism is distinct from other schools of Indian philosophy, like Theravadan Buddhism, Mahayana Buddhism, Kevala Advaita of Shankara, or um, any other schools in Vedanta like Ramanuja, Nimbarka, etc. Today is going to be quite the feast for you, so I hope you brought your appetite, because there are many things we're going to explore from a technical, academic point of view. But that's not the point of today's lecture, obviously. The point is to show you something. As you know, when you come here, the goal is not to be told something. I don't mean to tell you anything. I only mean to point something out. I'd like to show you something. Something that is immediately true in your own experience here and now. And having seen that truth, the necessary outcome must be Dukkha Nivriti, the permanent cessation of all forms of suffering in the body, in the mind, in the ego, and as well as Param Ananda Prapti, the attainment of the ultimate bliss. So the goal, no less, by the end of this lecture, is to realize that who you really are at your essence nature is beyond anything that can harm you, and more than that, to realize that you are inherently blissful in each and every moment, and to access that bliss. And, and enjoy that place in each and every moment is the purpose of this lecture, okay? So although we're going to get into some very juicy technical stuff regarding the spanda, the creative vibration within awareness that moves it into expression. Oh, hello, Dylan. Nice to finally see you. I've, I've seen Dylan's very astute comments in the chat for so long now, but now we put a face to the name. Welcome, brother. Welcome. So um, this spanda, this pure stirring within awareness, has um, a lot to say about why there is something rather than nothing. So, you know, the age-old philosophical question, why is there something rather than nothing? It's, it's even deeper than the question, what is this something, actually, you know? Because what is this something is a properly scientific question. You know, you can look at it and you can say, okay, the basic stuff of matter, what is that? It's atoms. You look a little closer. And then you say, no, John Dalton, you're wrong. It's not atoms. Those aren't the most discrete particles of matter. It's actually... Uh, neutrons and protons in a nucleus about which electrons are flowing. Okay, very well done, Ernest Rutherford. But how do these electrons flow? Okay, Niels Bohr will say, just like planets flow around their orbits, so too do electrons flow around their orbitals, making each atom like a miniature solar system. That, to me, is a pretty cool idea. But then they go further and they say, no, 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 Mr. Bohr, not quite. Actually, electrons cannot be so predictably tracked like that. They exist in probability clouds. And so electrons are more a probability than a thing. But at the very least, there are neutrons and protons, right? Not so fast. Those could be further subdivided into quarks and what have you. You know, uh, one physicist made the joke that if I knew I had to classify so much, I wouldn't have become a physicist. I would have become a zoologist or a biologist. <laughs> so many new particles are being discovered. So interestingly, the question, what is it? it being all of this, is a properly scientific question and it's being taken up by some of the leading experts in quantum mechanics and many of them are being confounded, right? Even from the time of Schrodinger, there's that book, What Is It? or something. What, what is the name of the book? I forget. But Schrodinger, he put out a beautiful book. Um, 
I forget. I almost said this is that or that I am or I am that. You know all those non-dual titles like Nisargadath Maharaj or something? His book is a little like the Schrodinger title is a bit like that. It escapes my mind. But uh, wh what is life? Thank you. Yes. What is life? And there, you know, he waxes lyrical about the Upanishads like many of his um, colleagues do also. Bohr was very fond of the Upanishads. So typically what ends up happening is these quantum mechanics looks, uh, mechanists look so closely at nature that it vanishes before their very eyes and they turn into mystics. They realize that they are the universe studying themselves, and then they get this like Shaiva revelation. So a good book for this is uh, Fritz Joff Capra. He has that book, The Tao of Physics, where you know apparently he's sitting on the beach and he's looking out into the ocean, and there's apparently a sunset, and he suddenly realizes, oh my God, I've been studying this all along. I've been studying the dance of matter and energy, and never once have I seen it the way I'm seeing it now. He had something of a spiritual revelation, and he said, I finally understand what the Hindu meant by the symbol of the dancing Shiva, a direct reference to the tradition that we're going to be unveiling today. Isn't that beautiful? He's been studying it all his life, he said, conceptually, abstractedly, not abstractedly, sorry, abstractly. Those are different words with very different connotations. I don't mean to accuse Mr. Professor Capra of studying abstractedly, but I'm sure he had those moments as we all do. Okay, I'm just saying. But he studied it in abstract. He studied it as a concept. But then at that beach, at that moment, he experienced the reality to which his concepts were pointing. So notice, what is this is a properly scientific question. And if you follow that question to its logical conclusion through experimental and theoretical physics, you will probably arrive at this point too. But the point that we're going to be approaching it today is a philosophical approach. And we're not going to ask, what is this? We're going to ask, why is this? And in truth, we've asked this in the last three lectures or so. So the, the discussion today about awareness and its innate playful nature manifesting as all of this will be a kind of account why there is something rather than nothing. So the first question we'll answer is why something rather than nothing. Um, but deeper than that, in answering this, why is there something rather than nothing, we'll also get an answer for what is this something. Hint, hint pure non-dual awareness. In other words, you. The entire universe is you. You are not in the universe. The universe is in you. The universe is a playful expression of you. The universe is your creative self-expression. These are all claims you're going to find from the non-dual Shaiva Tantra tradition or the Kaula Trika tradition. And all these claims we'll explore fully today. Again, I don't mean to tell you. I mean to show you. So it's not enough that you hear this and believe it and download it as some fancy Sanskrit jargon to impress your dinner friends with, dinner party friends with. No, it must be immediately true. And that's the goal of the lecture, okay? So why is there something rather than nothing? Or what is that something? All of this is given a very beautiful explanation by, by one simple word, spanda, the, the, the playful stirring within consciousness. I knew this day would come, and I've been waiting for this day with glee, because in our investigation into Kashmir Shaivism, this is one of those ideas that really sets it apart, really makes it a unique school of philosophy to study. And it's very juicy material, so I can't wait to get in. I just want to say two things first before we begin. Two, dis not disclaimers, but two preface-like statements. The first is, it's not enough to study these things on a conceptual level. We must ask the question, what does it show us? What insights can we get from this study? And in what way can we manifest those insights in each and every moment of our life to enjoy and experience um, profundity and meaning, etc.? That's the proper quest that we're on, the spiritual journey. So today, I think two things can be derived. One, and firstly, is this very thorny debate between two approaches in spiritual life. One is the approach of the direct path, which is what is currently, it's what it's calling itself, the direct path. And the other is the progressive path. So in spiritual life, you generally have two schools. The first, the direct path says, remember, you are already, even now, pure consciousness, pure non-dual consciousness. You are not the body, you are not the mind. Yes, Amanda Ma is right. They do have a Nataraja, a dancing Shiva outside of CERN, the Hadron Collider place, right? And that scared a lot of Christians. You're like, oh my God, you're doing some kind of satanic ritual. <laughs> yeah, it's called science. Because it's as much a satanic ritual as it gets, you know, because it gives you so much power and that power is going to be misused and uh, whatever. <laughs> There's a Tower of Babel moment imminent, maybe. I'm kidding. I'm not, I'm not going to spout doomsday prophecies at you. I know that's the way you make it on YouTube. You just have to spout doomsday prophecies at people and that's what they eat up. But no, I have no doomsday prophecies for you. <laughs> Even though Lord Shiva is the destroyer, he's only come to destroy the illusion. So you end up destroying what was never there and you end up attaining what was always yours. <laughs> so nothing too dramatic. And yet, profound. Okay. So, um, <laughs> so the direct path, they say this, you are pure non-dual consciousness beyond the body and the mind, and you are that now, right? So you, are, you, you aren't the body, nor are you the mind, nor are you the world. Given that that's true, what practice does the body need? What practice does the mind need? No practice is required. No effort is required. In fact, effort, practice can actually be counterproductive. 
Because the more you practice, the more you reify or rather buy into the doctrine that you are not as you are perfect and whole, that you are somehow lacking in need of growth, that you are somehow broken in need of fixing, that you are somehow um, sick in need of healing, right? Deficient in need of growing. All of these only perpetuate your samsara, your suffering. And as long as you believe that you are not now here in this moment perfect, you will never recognize that you are. So notice the direct path is a very important insight here. You can get obsessed with growth and progress, kind of pr prevalent, I think, in America. And as a result, you can come to see your spiritual life in those terms too. So you can start to feel as if um, you need to make gains or win something or, uh, you know, as, as if spiritual li life is like a prize at the end of the road. And as long as it's there waiting for you at some other moment in time, then as we said last week, you'll never get it because of course, tomorrow never comes because it's right here. And if you can't see it right here, you might may never see it. So the direct path is a very important insight to offer us that you are right now here. And, now, and it's not, again, I'm not telling you, hopefully the direct path can show you, can point it out so that you can notice this for yourself, that you are right now, right here, Shiva slash Brahman slash pure non-dual consciousness, slash the unspoken truth of the Buddha, whatever you want to call it. You know, you are pure spirit here and now. That's the direct path. So the positive side of the direct path is that it's absolutely speaking true. It's correct. This is not something that depends on samadhi or some mystical experience. Any mundane experience like waking, dreaming, deep sleep is sufficient to point out to you the truth of your nature. Okay, wonderful. Now the drawback of the direct path is its aversion to practice. So what typically ends up happening on the direct path is people go to a workshop, they hear Rupert Spira tell them that they are that or something, and then they come home and they forget. I mean, they intellectually know that they are that. You know, they've read Nisargadath Maharaj, they've read Ramana Maharshi, and they've spent a lot of time on the Reddit forums, you know, <laughs> they're I, what I call a chat room Brahmagyani. They know all the language, but when it actually comes down to it from a day-to-day -day life perspective, there's still a lot of suffering, still a lot of um, forgetting, still a lot of backsliding. So if one knew that they were that, then that should transform each and every moment of one's life. There should be a tremendous freedom, a tremendous easefulness, but often people don't find that to be the case. So then they desire some kind of practice, but the direct path speaks out against practice. So they're left in a bind. To practice, and if, I, if I practice, then I'm reifying the illusion that I am not that. But if I don't practice, no matter how many workshops I go to, and no matter how many times I told, I'm told I am that, I don't seem to be able to live as that or live according to my knowledge, you know? So you see the paradox? The direct path is right. But so is the progressive path. But they can't both be right. I mean, if the progressive path is right, then you are the body and mind and that you have to work and get the body to a certain state and have the mind enter into samadhi. And if the absolute path is right, then you don't need to practice on the level of the body and mind, right? What, what would that do for you? Pure awareness beyond all physicality and psychology. Do you see the paradox? Okay, so hopefully today's class can somewhat resolve it. In discussing this panda, necessarily we're going to discuss the two aspects of awareness, Shiva and Shakti. Now, people approaching this tradition for the first time will think that these two words, I mean necessarily because they are indeed two words, they'll think that there are two entities being pointed out here. There are two absolute realities, like in Sankhya, Purusha, and Prakriti. By the way, those of you who are new here, I recognize there are some new faces or not faces, rather new names, just Nama without the Rupa. Those of you who are new, I will be throwing a lot of Sanskrit words around. This is a pretty intermediate to advanced group now, if I may say so myself. I think all of you are quite um, versed in this philosophy. So I like to get into some material. So I might use some technical terms um, just to move along with this lecture. But just note, if if I'll, I'll try my best to translate as I go, but anytime there's anything too technical or the translation didn't come, just know there's a QA and a at the end of the lecture where we can explore these concepts, okay? Um, the ideas are more important than I think the culture um, and, 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 the, and the cultural language around these ideas, because these ideas are transcultural, they're universal. They're true in all different spiritual traditions and not at all exclusive to any one peoples at any one particular time, you know? Okay, so anyway, just, just for the new phases in the room, I'm about to get pretty technical, but then don't worry, I'll, I'll get breezy in just a few moments. So um, for those who are in the direct path, they might feel like um, I am pure, absolute, non-dual consciousness. That would be an emphasis on the Shiva aspect of non-dual consciousness, the static, changeless silence of non-dual consciousness. That's one of two aspects of the same thing. So pure non-dual consciousness is Shiva when it's still, static, spacious, when it's the container. Okay, and that's an experience that many people can have in between thoughts, in between breaths, in samadhi. Not necessarily samadhi, but anytime a person notices their spacious, still nature, that's the Shiva aspect of non-dual pure consciousness. So those of us who have more of that Shiva aspect proclivity, or maybe those of us who are recovering too much from like being identified with the body and mind, for such an audience, the direct path teaching is like lightning. 
tremendously liberating, absolutely thrilling, you know, because it gives you that maybe element which you were lacking, that Shiva aspect. But notice, the direct path is heavily biased towards the Shiva aspect. It doesn't see, in, in some cases, the Buddhist and the Advaita Vedantins, they don't even see that Shakti aspect as real. It, does, it doesn't even exist. You know, it's just Shiva. Now, on the other hand, the progressive path people might be valuing the Shakti aspect, the purely imminent aspect of pure consciousness, body and mind. So they're seeing everything in terms of body and mind, and they might miss that spacious silence Shiva, that pure awareness that is between thoughts, between breaths, beyond body and mind. So notice they're heavily biased towards the Shakti aspect. So therefore, a paradox arises when we're not able to see that these two aspects, Shiva and Shakti, are really two sides of the same coin, where the stuff of that coin is far more important than the shapes on either side of the heads or tails, you know? So today, hopefully by the end of the class, you'll see that Shiva is Shakti and Shakti is Shiva. Um, we have a very important phrase in this tradition, Kumba gatas cheti tataiva banyate. Just as the word Kumba in Sanskrit and Gata in Sanskrit both mean pot, it's not like these two words are pointing out a different thing. They both mean the same entity. So too does the word Shiva and Shakti refer to the same reality. And that thou art. Okay, so in talking about the Spanda, I hope in the course of our lecture that we can offer a real tangible solution to this age-old paradox of direct path versus progressive path. So hopefully by the end of this class, you can practice your spiritual practices in a progressive way with gusto. You can throw yourself headfirst into like the effort of renunciation and the effort of getting to your mat to meditate daily for increasing quantity and quality. You can throw yourself with gusto at your puja practice, at your asana practice, all of that, you know. You can work on the level of the body and mind with a uh, 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 goal-oriented sort of mindset. You can do that, but never will you lose touch with the absolute truth. And as you rest in the absolute truth, never do you become complacent and forget about the integration that needs to happen on the level of the body and mind. So by the end of this lecture, those of you who have been struggling with this paradox between absolute and relative will see a, a viable resolution through this understanding of Shiva Shakti being not two, but one and the same entity. Just like as Sri Ramakrishna would say, a snake is both still and wriggling. Does that mean that it's two different things, a still snake and a wriggling snake? No. Right? And to further complicate the issue, the paradox here is that it's not still or wriggling at different times. This being beyond time, it's both wriggling and still at the same time, <laughs> if you can get your head around that. <laughs> and it doesn't wriggle through space. Space wriggles within it. Oh my god. <laughs> okay, now that was a pretty sexy, clickbaity thing to say. Okay, now let's get into the second thing that I hope to discuss in this lecture. Renunciation. In fact, you'll be excited to hear this. The spanda is not only the doctrine of dancing awareness, it also gives us a metaphysical explanation for why sex is so nice, actually. And not only that, it actually gives us the explanation for why sex is so easily renounced when one experiences the bliss of awareness being aware of itself. So why is it that the greatest masters of our time, Buddha, Jesus, Ramakrishna, have always preached celibacy? Why is it that like sexual, physical pleasure is valid, is wonderful, but not apparently a part of like the, the lives of these like great renunciants. And some of them are our householders, right? Like Abhinava Gupta, for instance, they've all claimed that the joy of awareness being aware of itself is far more blissful than wine or women, as Abhinava Gupta famously says in his Anuttara uh, Ashtika, his eight stanzas on liberation. He says, the joy of this is unlike any other joy in the world. Why is that? So I'm going to make a claim that the reason sex is nice is because of the spanda. And once one discovers the spanda, one is united with the ultimate source of bliss, such that all desire for any other activity falls away. I'm basically going to pull a Freud on Freud. I'm going to say, if Freud claims that everything is reduced to sex, I'm going to say, ultimately, sex can be reduced to spanda. The throb and pulsation and vibration of pure awareness. That's the second claim I want to make. And the third claim I think is very important to me is to distinguish spanda from a materialist physicalization of that term. So typically when people hear vibration, they think, ah, that tallies with quantum mechanics, the world, string theory, it vibrates, everything is, vi yes, but not quite. Spanda is far deeper and far subtler than mere physical vibration. So the way to understand it is not through a physicalist kind of materialist lens, but through a spiritual lens that I hope to introduce today. However, having understood it through a spiritual lens, the physicalist notion makes more sense. You can see how the world vibrating is a reflex of awareness vibrating. So this is not a physical stirring, it's a spiritual stirring. You see, isn't that cool? We get to talk about sex a little bit. My favorite topic, obviously all your favorite topics too, but from the, the deepest point of view, which is why it's such an obsession with people and why it is that spiritual life is necessarily a redirection of that same energy, which is valid and wonderful, but a redirection of that same energy to even deeper and deeper and subtler and more fulfilling forms of the same. Okay, so essentially we'll talk about the thing that we've been talking about together for some time, renunciation and why that's so important, particularly renunciation of karma desire or lust. 
And I think the Spanda can give us a really good key uh, as to why that's important, how, or more importantly, how that can be achieved. So by the end of this lecture, hopefully I'll, I'll be able to answer Madeline's question because she asked a really great question. Also, <laughs> this is so trippy. I'm looking at the screens because I like to see your faces, right? And then silicon-based life form, he's doing a Shiva reflecting himself back to himself kind of thing. So I'm like, what's going on here? It's... <laughs> Thanks, bro. Anyway, good to see you, Keely. It's been a while. It's nice to see you, Julie. And hello, Feeny. Hello, Alicia. Yeah, Any anytime I see people's face, like it's like, I'm like, oh, hello. Anyway, so Madeline last week asked a beautiful question. How much efforting is really involved in renunciation? Is it absolutely effortless? Like, does it just one day, I mean, like one day you wake up and you're like, oh yeah, I'm not interested in playing with Lego blocks anymore. And you just stop. Or is it more like one day you wake up and you say, oh my God, I'm starting to recognize that playing with Lego blocks is perpetuating a cycle of suffering that seems to drag me into repetitive behaviors and therefore I need to drop it now. And so I practice dropping it. Which one is it? Is it like a spontaneous, I wake up and I no longer care for Legos? Or is it more of like, I wake up and I realize through insight that Legos are kicking my ass and now I need to drop them? Which is it, right? And um, there are obviously two models and various more besides right um yeah exactly yeah the man went to the ganga and decided to renounce lust was it so easy was it spontaneous did it happen immediately upon stepping out of the ganga or was there a journey there was there a process was there some in other words was there some effort involved in renunciation by the way the moment you say effort the direct path people will freak out they'll be like that's wrong that's manifesting untrue Re effort no 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 stop stop no effort relax and then they become complacent, right? But then if you say effortlessness, the progressive path people will lose their shit. They'll be like, oh, no, what? Effortlessness? You mean you're not gonna do anything? You're not gonna meditate? You're not gonna do puja? You're not gonna do japa? You're lost. So notice the word effort is a pet peeve for the um, Shiva people. And the word effortless is a pet peeve for the Shakti people. Kaula Tantrikas laugh at this. You know, they say, oh my God, you're talking about the same thing from different angles. So there's a very important um, word. It's Wu Wei. The Taoists speak of this. Wu Wei means actionless action or effortless effort. Okay, what is that? You know, if you are a Shaiva, like the, the Shiva oriented person, you know what you're going to say? You're going to say it's just effortlessness. And if you are a, a pro Shakta progressive path person, you're going to say it's just effort. No, it's, it's something far subtler than that. You can't just use the word, word Wu Wei just like you would use the word Shiva or Shakti to only imply one of its two aspects, you see. Yeah, it is. It is. It's an aspect of Kriya. In fact, what we're going to teach today through the, the concept of Spanda is from moving from karma to Kriya, making spiritual practice, not karma, but Kriya for, for those who um, are familiar with the technical term there. Okay. So Kriya, I think is a nice way to say effortless action, though it's very dynamic. It's rooted in stillness. So hopefully that's the practical takeaway that we can gain from this lecture. Hmm? beyond just the academic stuff that we're going to discuss. But that stuff's going to be pretty cool too. So let's just dive right into it. Okay, so as you'll recall, I'm going to put a map in front of you. Oh, by the way, please recall the most important disclaimer, especially for those of you coming to this class for the first time, is that these are spiritual concepts, meaning they are not to be understood merely on an intellectual level, though doing so would be quite good in and of itself. But more than that, they are meant to be directly, immediately experienced here now. So the rule that we typically have at these um, gatherings is that if it's not immediately true for you, you must call it out. So in the Q&A, you must say, I don't know about that. That doesn't check out with my experience. And maybe there might be a different way to phrase it that would. You know, so you must always ask, is this true for me? So the rule in this community is it's not true unless it's true for you. Okay, don't be told, be shown. That's the idea. That's the first thing. The second thing is that um, no one tradition anywhere has a monopoly on truth. No one religion alone is true. However, there are universal principles common to all religions. And through a proper inquiry into any one religion, ideally, one understands all the rest too, to some extent. So try your best to, to see these concepts in their pure transcultural light, meaning see them in their universal aspect beyond the Sanskrit words or the you know mythologies and imagery and symbology that I'm going to invoke to have this discussion. Necessarily, these ideas were developed within the context of a tradition that emerged in India called Kaula Trika Tantra, a tantric tradition, um, but a non-dual variant of a very broad and sophisticated tradition. So of course, I'm speaking from a, a particular viewpoint, a particular lens, and it's one of many lenses. But hopefully, our, our learning today can, can take a transcultural flavor. Look to the universal principles. Okay, that's the second disclaimer. The third disclaimer is, if anything gets too heady, don't worry about it. Um, in the Q&A, we can, we can look into it, okay? All right. So, 
let me put that map in front of you. Now, remember, a tatwa map is like a depiction of the principles of ultimate reality. So it's like the foundational building blocks upon which reality is built. And there are many different kinds of tatwa maps. The most famous of them being <laughs> good silicon-based life form, ready to lift. The gym bro has come. He's ready to lift. <laughs> so um, a tatwa map is going to be a kind of linguistic symbolic depiction of ultimate reality. Tat, as you know in Sanskrit, means that. Thwa means ism. So tatwa means that ism, an almost untranslatable word. It basically means um, a map of ultimate reality, meaning a discrete counting, uh, or, or rather a counting of the discrete building blocks upon which reality is based. Now reality, the word reality for the Indian mind cannot be limited to just physical reality, nor can it be limited to just the reality experienced in waking life. The word reality must include what is experienced in dream. And more importantly, it must include what is experienced in deep sleep. Now, this is a way of thinking that many Westerners are not familiar with. In the West, we do almost all our philosophy in the waking state. In fact, we don't consider anything real unless it appears to us while we're awake. But we forget that that's only one third of the totality of our experience. Not one third in terms of time, but one in some cases, yes, but one third in terms of degree or kind you know there's dream we spend a lot of time in dream and while we're in the dream the dream feels as real as real so that must be included too and not only that in deep sleep in the absence of any dream imagery in the absence of the waking world i somehow persist at least insofar as i'm able to wake up and say i slept dreamlessly there was somebody there to whom the absence of deep sleep occurred so that must be included too right so at the very least we must have a tatwa map an accounting of reality that is comprehensive and includes waking, dreaming, and deep sleep. But not only that, it must also include um, mystical experiences because those have been not only had by mystics here and there, but by such a, a corroborated and peer-reviewed system of mystics that they cannot be discounted. So even mystical experience is included in tatwa maps, right? Now, Sankhya and Vedanta doesn't necessarily intend to include mystical experience in their tatwa map. But um, Kaula Trika Tantra does. And Abhinava Gupta, in his Tantra Loka, is interested in actually classifying and categorizing uh, varieties of mystical experiences too as part of his Tattva map. Okay, so this Tattva map, I'm going to put it on the screen. It's not typically visually depicted like this. It's just taught. Um, but when visually depicted, it can be quite helpful. So we've been studying, as you know, this Tattva map. And today, hopefully, we can make some headway into the stuff that we didn't do last week. So we, hopefully, we can mop up this stuff. But we're just going to start here at the bottom of the Tatwa map. And as you know from the last two lectures, reality, according to the Sankhya school of philosophy, is split into three things. In fact, it might be helpful to look even at this. Oh my God, it became so small. Look at all the empty space around this thought. Isn't that pretty Shiva? Direct path, people rejoice. Look at that. Oh my God. I don't know what happened. <laughs> okay, give me a second. Okay, so. Oh. Okay, there we go. This might be helpful to see this particular diagram. The diagram at the top here, there's the subject, which is aham, and then there is the um, object, idam, and there's something in between. So the subject is the perceiver, the object is the thing perceived, and there's some relation between me and that which appears to me. Pretty, pretty straightforward, right? Now, remember, all of this philosophy is being done on the basis of phenomenology. See, I got it right this time. Phenomenology. It means the direct immediate experience available to you now. So we're not reasoning based on, you know, axioms, mathematical axioms, nor are we reasoning based on religious, like theological axioms, nor are we even reasoning based on metaphysical, mystical experience. We're reasoning just based on what's available to us now as a matter of fact experience. So right now, as we've been saying, um, it's clear that things appear to me and it's clear that I am here. I must be because I'm aware of things appearing to me. Now, the subject, as Sankhya will say, is this Purusha, as you can see over here. This Purusha, this witnessing subject. Now, this Purusha is pure consciousness. Now, using the body and using the mind, it experiences a world. So according to Sankhya, the world is both physical and subtle. It's made up of five elements and five subtle elements. So you can think of like physical earth, physical water, physical fire, physical wind, physical space. But you can also think of maybe subtle earth, like the earth of dreams, or subtle water, like the lakes and oceans in your dream or daydream. You can think of subtle forms, 
subtle movements in space and wind like that. So there's two types of matter, physical and subtle. Obviously, science hasn't really today categorized anything as subtle matter, though thoughts and emotions would count as that. Um, or you could say, you know, there's a scientist recently who posited the existence of perceptrons, a new kind of matter. And that echoes very much this ancient Indian idea that there is a kind of matter, a, 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 a variant of matter called subtle matter, stuff of dreams or the stuff of vibes. So altogether, these 10 make up the object. So we can just call this very simply. Oh my God, don't even look at that. We can just call this idam, right? So all that appears to you, the five physical elements and the five subtle elements, they're all just on the level of the object, idam. How do you define an object? That which appears to you that which you are aware of. So by definition, the objects of the world around you are chairs, tables, people, right? The objects are thoughts, emotions. You're aware of thoughts, you're aware of emotions, you're aware of sensations. So the entire world, as well as the subtle psychic world of thoughts, emotions, and dreams, all of that comes under one category, idam. So we took 10 things, 10 discrete tatwas, and condensed them into one tatwa, idam. So who can deny this? Who can deny that in their experience of reality, there are objects? Seems like a tautological statement. Like, duh. Like, seems like a, no, not tautological. Truism. It seems like a truism. Like, duh, there are objects, right? So no one can deny that. So our tatwa mat must include that. Now, no one can also deny. No one, no one can also. Also, no one can deny that there is a subject. If there are any objects whatsoever, that necessitates a subject to whom those objects occur. So I wouldn't know about tables or chairs or a world if I wasn't here to experience any of that. So this is maybe one basic assumption of Western science, that there exists a world without any observers. It's an assumption that's being challenged by quantum mechanics as early as like the double slit experiment, you know, Copenhagen inference, Heisenberg uncertainty principle, like as early as that, uh, quantum mechanics is challenging the notion that the universe exists objectively. So that's the first thing. You can't really do this kind of philosophy if you uh, make this materialist assumption that seems to be so prevalent in the Western world that the world exists even without anybody to experience it. Impossible. Because without a subject, there could be no objects. If you weren't here, how do you know the world is? You see, so you, the subject, again, are absolutely indubitable. So aham, I am, and idam, that is, or this, right? So I am and this. These are two phrases that are very important in our study of Kashmir Shaivism. Now, what is I am? Purusha, pure consciousness. What is this? Prakriti. And Prakriti, as you know, includes all of these types of matter, physical and subtle. However, the link between them, it seems, is, or, or I would say the link between Purusha and the world is these organs of action, organs of perception and mind. So altogether, these 13 tattvas constitute the instrument through which the perceiver perceives a world. So body and mind are instruments. And through them, I experience a world. This is a profound teaching. Because if one understands this teaching, one is never afraid of old age, sickness, and death anymore. Because our whole problem comes from identifying with the instruments not the user of the instrument. So if I really thought I was my knife, I would freak out if the knife got blunt or if it broke or something. I use a knife to chop vegetables, right? Similarly, I use a mind and body to experience a world. So if the knife breaks, what's that to me? The user of the knife. Similarly, if the body were to break, if the mind were to break, what's that to me? The one who uses the body and mind to experience the world. So this idea of instrumentality is very important. An instrument is something I can pick up and put down. I can't pick up and put down the body and mind. And actually I do, short of samadhi, every night in deep sleep, I put down the body and mind and yet I exist. In deep sleep without the instruments, I remain the user of the instruments without my instruments. Still, here I am. So it's a very important insight, you know, that body and mind are instruments and through them, I receive objects, namely physical sensations and subtle sensations of the quality thoughts and emotions, right? Isn't that nice? Um, yeah, so you know, the problem is knives are for cutting vegetables. You shouldn't hold it while talking to your loved one. That's typically what we do, right? We, we hold so tightly to our body and mind and we identify so tightly with this particular limited individual. Um, and that's the source of all our problems. Just like if you were to hold your knife while having a loving conversation with someone. <laughs> so instrumentality, body and mind are the instruments through which the purusha is united to prakriti. Pretty basic stuff. Now, now we can do some really interesting philosophy building up to the spanda. What's the relationship between purusha and prakriti? Now, according to Sankhya, nothing really. 
No, it exists on the level of absolute tattvas, right? And we're going to get to it. Actually, you can't really understand the spanda without para, 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 and apara as we'll, as we'll get to. But you'll notice even within Purusha and Prakriti, you get this para idea, the transcendental witness self, subject, Purusha, that is pure awareness, the one that is there in deep sleep. You get apara, which is the objective world, which is, you know, of course, subtle and physical. Then, of course, you have the link between them, para, para, technical terms within the tradition to, to denote the knower, the known, and the link, knowing. So knower, knowing, known, that triad exists in a lower manifestation in this first part of the tattwa map. You can think of the tattwa map as three levels, actually. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to derive an even bigger triangle. No, Illuminati revealed. Anyway, there's going to be an even bigger triangle. Not really, by the way. The YouTube people get so excited when you drop words like that. You know, till today, you know what my most popular video is on YouTube? The lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram. People love Western ceremonial magic, right? So in that video, we talk about like demons and angels. People got like, they're like, yeah, demons, angels. Um, so <laughs> if I start talking about Illuminati, then people get excited. But no, I, I don't mean to. <laughs> so no, but the triangle of knower knowing known exists on many different levels, just as the tatwa map gets increasingly subtler as we continue. So let's get a little subtler. Now, it, this alone is a profound teaching. But when we go deeper, we realize that it's not entirely true. Because if we say Purusha and Prakriti have no relationship to one another, then we have to ask, well, how is there anything rather than nothing? And Sankhya will say, we don't need to answer that question. Just take it for granted. There is something. You know, obviously there is something. And then you have to ask, well, whenever I see something, I always infer the existence of a cause. If I see like, for instance, uh, an anthill, never once do I think the anthill spontaneously appeared. I always think that there was some cause for the anthill. Maybe some kid built it and then ants moved in or more likely ants built it. But whatever might've been the cause, the effect being perceived, the cause can be inferred. Karya drishti, karana, um, what is it? it was uh, asti karta. Karana drishti, if I see a cause, asti karta, the Sanskrit term there is, if there is something, there must be something that caused it. Cause and effect is necessary in any manifestation. So then you ask, well, what's the cause of all of this? What's the maha karana, the supreme cause? And Sankhya gives you something like a big bang. There are three gunas, and next week we're going to talk about the gunas a bit more in the context of Kashmir Shai. And those gunas got shaken up, who knows why? And this entire world manifested through the play of these three gunas, tamas, rajas, and sattva. So again, it's just like Big Bang. Like there was a moment of stillness, this avyaktam, this unmanifest state. And then suddenly out of that, like arising out of quantum foam came this world, this world of various things. And then one day it will all in a big crunch-like moment return to that quote-unquote mula prakriti or quantum foam or primordial matter space stuff, if you will. So there's no explanation beyond that. Now, the assumption that Sankhya makes is very similar to the assumption of um, materialist Western science, which is that the world exists independently. It just is there and it, 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 it's largely going on it's with its processes, automatically, mechanically, of its own you know, kind of accord. However, this doesn't hold up to philosophical scrutiny. Obviously, as long as the world is there, there must be someone to whom the world appears. There cannot be a world if there isn't a perceiver of such a world because to posit the existence of a world um, apart from the perceivers, would be to posit something that is principally unverifiable. That would be a manifestly unscientific thing to posit, that there exists something that is there, even without any perceivers. Who will verify such a thing to exist? So therefore, already there's a relationship. Notice, even in Sankhya, you can see there is some relationship between Sankhya, I mean, the Sankhyan Purusha and the Sankhyan Prakriti, that of observer and observed. There's an interplay between subject and object here. And of course, in previous lectures, we talked about how the object, the Prakriti, exists to give Purusha both Bhoga and Apavarga, both experience and ultimate liberation. Okay, So Prakriti seems to be offering something to Purusha, and Purusha in turn seems to be offering something to Prakriti. There's, there seems to be a kind of interplay. And that interplay is wonderful, because Purusha goes through a series of the first kiss in high school, and then graduating high school and going to university and then, you know, um, graduating university or not, and then going on to do something and then being horribly depressed and then having a creative slump, just like the whole Dr. Seuss, oh, the places you'll go. Okay. So like, obviously there's so many exciting things that can happen to a person in this life. And all of that is brought to you by Prakriti. So already there's like a, an inherent meaning there, right? So Purusha derives meaning from Prakriti and Prakriti ultimately gives Purusha the insight whereby Purusha is free. Okay. Now, as we said last week, it's manifestly wrong to consider each Purusha distinct from every other Purusha because um, Purusha, awareness, is beyond time, space, and causality. It's beyond name and form. 
So as such, you cannot distinguish one Purusha from another. I won't get into this argument again. We talked about it last week. But the conclusion you're left with is that it's not true for Sankhya to say that there are discrete Purushas. A any more true than it would be to say that there are discrete parts of the sky. The sky is one indivisible mass of light. Similarly, awareness is one indivisible mass of consciousness. Similarly, um, each one of us is just one person looking through different eyes. Some of us are conditioned to perceive this way. Some of us are conditioned to perceive that way. And obviously the differences are in mind, in knowledge, but not in awareness. So now note this. It's very important to note this when we talk about Spanda. Awareness doesn't change, though mind does. So if you conflate awareness with the mind, you'll think that awareness is changing when really it's the mind that's changing. So take this example. Early in the morning, you feel sleepy, incredibly drowsy. Um, will you say that you are less aware? No, you're drowsy, but you are aware of being drowsy. Now, let's say you drink a cup of coffee. Suddenly you feel fresh and you're alert. Will you say that you're now more aware? See, Tejas Ma is drinking her coffee. I've got some kind of chocolate mushroom thing. No, it's just lion's mane like that. Don't get excited. It's not like, I, I know there's some people in this room who are like, yeah, the truth is only in psychedelics. No, 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 I'm sorry. I, I'm not really interested in that. This is just some kind of regular like, Lion's mane, cordyceps kind of thing. I don't know, some kind of LA nonsense. Anyway, um, I like it though. So anyway, <laughs> um, when I drink the cup of coffee and my mind is suddenly fresh and alert, now it's not, the it's not awareness that changes. I'm not more aware. I'm just as aware of the awake mind as I would be the drowsy mind. Do you see? I'm aware of the awake mind. I'm aware of the drowsy mind. I'm aware the same throughout. I was just as equally aware of drowsiness as I am aware of wakefulness. What's changing here is the mind. Now you might say we're all different because Julie knows X and Paulina knows Y, right? So Julie must be different from Paulina because they both know different sets of things. They've had different life experiences, right? Like Julie's memories are X and Paulina's memories are Y. They don't know about each other's memories. So is that a change in awareness? No, it's a change in mind. Paulina's mind is formally different from Julie's mind. Julie's mind is X, X to include all that Julie knows and all of Julie's memories. And then Paulina's mind is Y, Y including all that Paulina knows and all that um, Paulina has experienced as a matter of her some scars or memories. So these are obviously different. We can't say that Julie, mind X, is the same as Paulina, mind Y. That would be impossible. But we can say that the awareness to whom mind X and mind Y appears is the one and the same awareness. So in this sense, notice you are omniscient. This is proof of your omniscience, by the way, because everything that exists either exists as something you know or something you don't know. So there are only two categories, two sample sets in your mind, known and unknown. Now, it seems like unknown is far broader, right? Unknown is like so many things. And I'm not saying that just because it's unknown, it doesn't exist. No, obviously it exists, but it exists as a potential to be known. So there might be other planets out there, but that's still known because you know there are other planets out there, but you don't know what's on them. So yet to be discovered is what's on the other planet out there, right? So that exists as the pure potential unknown. Now, what exists as your knowledge is, you know, what you know. Now, both of them exist in you awareness. So you are both aware of what you know, and you are aware of what is yet to be known. Notice how your awareness, the awareness that you are includes everything, everything that was, is, and could be. So both known and unknown, you are aware of them equally. That's mind blowing, right? So notice now we have one awareness and that awareness is aware of bodies and minds. It remaining one is now interacting with innumerable bodies and minds and innumerable worlds through, through bodies and minds, through those bodies and minds, um, one can see such worlds. So again, you're left with the subject object and the interplay. However, you no longer have a plurality of subjects. You have one subject. So then we go up a little higher on the Tatwa map and what we get is Maya. And now Maya is described in Advaita Vedanta as something you can't really describe. <laughs> so the description is it's undescribable, <laughs> which seems a bit convenient, right? It's anirvachaniya. Maya is and also isn't. Anyway, Kashmir Shaivism rejects that and says Maya can be described as these five things. The feeling of being a limited individual, being only able to do some things and not everything. The feeling of knowing only a few things and feeling like that's all there is to know. The feeling of desiring some things or desiring only to know some things. The feeling of being bound to time and the feeling of being bound to karma or cause and effect. So notice, Maya, to put it very succinctly, is feeling wrongly. Maya is thinking wrongly. Whenever I think wrongly about who I am, 
I'm necessarily going to feel wrongly about who I am. So Maya is that power or that potency whereby a person comes to be mistaken, mistaken about who they really are or mistaken about what will really fulfill them. So just note that for now. Now we get into the really cool stuff. This stuff that I hinted at last week. And we're going to now find a way to describe why Maya and why the plurality of Purushas, why does Prakriti, the Mula Prakriti, the primordial matter evolve into Buddhi, Ahankara, Manas? Why does Manas evolve into the organs of perception? Why do those evolve into the organs of action? Why do those pour forth a world to be perceived and acted upon? Why any of this? Why something rather than nothing? Now we come to it, friends. The Spanda theory of Kashmir Shaivism. Now remember, in... Um, Prakriti, Purusha of Sankhya, there's no explanation for why Prakriti, right? Prakriti just is. Purusha just is. For Advaita Vedanta, there is an explanation. The explanation is Maya. Because of Maya, there appears to be many Purushas and there appears to be a Prakriti distinct from Purusha. But that's not true. There is no Prakriti distinct from Purusha, just as like there is no copper water bottle distinct from the copper. So therefore, Prakriti is an appearance in Purusha just as a copper water bottle is an appearance in copper. Purusha is the basic substance of the universe, but that universe is an appearance. It's not an actual manifestation or anything. So Maya gives us, according to Advaita Vedanta, the sense that there is something when really there is nothing. So both Buddhism and Advaita Vedanta will not deny that something appears, but they will deny that something is really there. Just like they won't deny that there is indeed a mirage over yonder in the desert, but they will deny that that mirage has any water at all. Right? It's a very good metaphor and Shankara uses it often. No amount of water in the mirage will wet the desert sands because it's a mirage. Similarly, no amount of things, no plurality, no appearance could ever change the one non-dual pure consciousness because it just appears. It never exists. Okay. So anyway, that's really deep philosophy, Advaita Vedanta, Buddhism. I know there are some people from like high school here, which is very exciting. And that stuff, you know, we'll have to go into on a separate occasion. It's very deep and in many ways foundational for what we're going to talk about now. So if the rest of this lecture is sounding a bit weird, um, forgive me, because we're going to jump into something a little more technical now. <laughs> All right. Okay, let's go. So I'm going to show you a different map now. So remember, we're talking about this Purusha, right? Purusha in Sankhya is, a, is, is, is discrete and there are many of them. Whereas Purusha in Advaita Vedanta, there's only one. It's called Atman or Brahman. It's the one pure non-dual consciousness. Now, we're going to transition from the word Brahman to Shiva because Shiva, as we've described, has a few nuances that set it apart from Brahman. Let's look at it. Oh my god, that's Ekabumi Elix art, which is really beautiful. Thank you. So, now we have this very important idea that Brahman is in this tradition just called Shiva. Shiva doesn't mean in this tradition at this point the pure non-dual Oh, sorry, it doesn't mean the blue guy seated atop the mat. It includes that, but it means something more like Brahman with a few nuances. So when we say Bhairava or Hridaya, that's the Kaula Trika's version of Brahman. But the reason they don't want to use the Brahm Brahman word, the B word, is because they mean a few different things by it. So first of all, to understand Spanda, it's important that you understand that there are two aspects to Bhairava, as we said maybe two or three lectures ago. Prakasha. Now, Prakasha is the chit shakti, the power whereby awareness is aware of things. So I'm aware of the screen. I'm aware of my absolute lack of ability to edit videos. I'm aware that I don't know how to like patch those two videos together and that I'm going to need to talk to Julie at some point to do that for me. So that's the power of awareness, right? I'm aware of the void of deep sleep. I'm aware of dreams. That's chit shakti. But also, interestingly, I'm aware of being aware. So not only am I aware, I'm also self-aware. That's called Vimarsha. Now, this is something you just have to accept axiomatically for now. But if you want, in the Q&A, I can give you some pretty um, beautiful arguments, very subtle arguments to prove it from a philosophical point of view. But for now, I just want to offer it as an axiom. When awareness is aware of itself, it experiences tremendous bliss. There is nothing quite so blissful as being aware of being aware. And maybe you can verify this for yourself when you rest in between breaths or when you, you know, just rest in between thoughts or you have those peak experiences in your life where the mind is stunned into silence and you're just aware of being aware. You're just simply being. There's a kind of thrill. It so enchants the heart. It so delights the, the soul. It's, it's so thrilling, but in a way that cannot really be described. It's, it's deep. And, and in fact, it's often called beauty or profundity or meaning. It doesn't typically get called happiness or joy. It's too deep for that because you can experience it even during sorrow. 
even during tragedy. You could be miserable and still feel deep down inside that stirring, that beautiful sense of being aware of being aware. Just being. There's something inherently blissful about being. Now, being, notice, is pure awareness, right? Being is awareness. And awareness, by virtue of its being, is self-aware. So there's no way to um, delineate between being and being aware. Being necessitates, necessitates awareness, and awareness necessitates being. So chit and, or, or sat and chit go together, right? But interestingly, um, there's a bliss to that. There's a bliss to simply being and to simply being aware. So the tradition calls this ananda shakti. Ananda Shakti is the bliss of awareness being aware of itself. So the word Prakasha and the word Vimarsha, they come from the Pratya Bhigya tradition, founded by like Somananda and continued on by Utpala Deva and, and what have you, you know? So Prakasha and Vimarsha. Chit Shakti, Ananda Shakti. These are the basic primal, primeval powers of awareness. Now, interestingly, notice they're called powers. Interestingly, something happens. There's a, the, a kind of alchemical, dare I say, reaction between awareness and being self-aware that creates this Icha Shakti. Icha Shakti, as we've described previously, is this precognitive urge, this deep desire. That's not a desire in the sense of I need something to make me feel fulfilled. Rather, I feel so fulfilled, therefore I have to express myself. That kind of desire, as we clarified last week. So that Icha Shakti, where from does it come? How do you get that? What, is, is it just pure awareness? No, actually, it arises through something, as we'll describe now. Um, it's, it's fundamental to awareness, just as heat is fundamental to fire. But it's actually the product, this willing, this precognitive urge to express oneself is the product, actually, in some sense, of this awareness being aware of itself. And through Icha Shakti comes the world. So Icha Shakti, um, Jnana Shakti, and most importantly, Kriya Shakti, which is the power by which the world is manifested, sustained, destroyed, etc. The dancing Shiva, you know, I'm sure you're familiar with that image. All of that is the five Kriyas, the, the Panchakrityas, the five actions of Lord Shiva. So like, interestingly, if you look at this map over here, all of this from Maya downwards, I mean, sorry, from from Sada, by the way, this is not Sada Shiva, it's Sada Shiva. There's a diacritical error here, just note. So from Sada Shiva downwards, all of that is an expression of Icha Shakti. So Icha Shakti, Jnana Shakti, Kriya Shakti is what causes Maya to appear. And Maya, through its veiling effect, creates the sense that Shiva is the Purusha. In other words, Shiva is the Jiva. So we feel like discrete atomized particles of pure consciousness. More than that, we as pure consciousness identify with the instruments through which we perceive the world. More than that, we become attached and bewitched and enchanted by the world of objects. So we've turned our attention wholly outward, you see. We're interested now in the objects. We're identified with the instruments and we're wholly ignorant of the truth of our being, the essence, nature, pure consciousness. Why? Because of Maya. But Maya pours forth as the creative self-expression of Icha. As we said two lectures ago, that creative expression is at first the desire to veil oneself from oneself for the sake of playing a game. So we're coming to the Shiva Leela concept in just a bit. And that game is the game of rediscovering one's true nature. And that can only happen if one forgets one's true nature. So Icha Shakti, this precognitive urge to express oneself, expresses itself in two phases. Phase one is the phase of self-concealment, which is done through Maya. So Maya with its five kanchukas, or rather five veils, or five tricks, I might like to translate it that way, um, causes the Shiva, the one non-dual consciousness that you are, to feel itself to be a Purusha. But not only that, it's a Purusha endowed with desire. A desire for what? The world which it perceives through the senses. So now it's so hypnotized and bewitched by, by sex and money and power that it never once thinks to its true nature. It's constantly looking outwards, like the Kena Upanishad says, right? Beautifully, that our eyes are pierced such that we only look outwards. Wise is he who turns inward towards their source. So we're always looking outward for some kind of fulfillment, and there's no wonder we're not fulfilled because we aren't the body and mind. And all that the world can offer is food for the body and mind. If I'm a body and mind, that might be enough for me. But it's not. No amount of pleasure for the body, no amount of acquisition for the mind, no amount of accolades, none of it can ever truly fulfill me. And then the spiritual quest begins. So through Maya, I become obsessed with the earth. And through suffering on the level of earth, I become interested in going back to Purusha. So now begins the second phase of this play, the phase of self-revelation, which is seemingly a progressive phase of discovering more and more what you are. So you begin to discover that you're Purusha. Then you discover that this Maya has caused you to feel discreet when really you are one. Then you discover that the world is not um, separate from you and is rather an appearance in you. And then maybe you discover that it's an expression, etc. You just go up the ladder until you recognize what you truly are. Shiva, 
slash Shakti. So now all I want to say at this juncture, before I get into the uh, Spanda proper, is that there is something quite blissful, no, about being aware of being aware. There is nothing quite so blissful as being aware of being aware. So the game of awareness is premised upon the deepest possible bliss there is, the bliss of being self-aware. Now, that bliss is the bliss of constant self-discovery. Awareness is aware, and then it's suddenly aware of being aware. It's like, oh, I am. Oh, I am that I am. Like, that's it. That's the bliss of awareness. It's playing with itself. Now, this is going to, of course, be best symbolized in sexual terms. So we give the concept of Shiva and Shakti as husband and wife. They're a pair of householders. Shiva is pure consciousness, and Shakti is um, the consciousness becoming aware of itself. So their lovemaking is really nothing more than consciousness being aware of itself. The union of Shiva Shakti, that Yamala, yoga, the word yoga here, Yamala, union, means um, coarsely, you know, gramya. Gramya means like in Sanskrit, like coarse language. So the gramya meaning of Yamala is to like, have sex, right? But the lakshanam, the implied meaning here, the deeper meaning is awareness being aware of itself. So this is the urge that awareness feels, okay? Just mark this closely because we're going to start talking about sex in just a moment. The deepest urge innate to awareness, this icha shakti, is the, the urge to be aware of oneself, right? Recently, Tejas knows, but recently I went to this like trippy hippie sort of situation. A friend had invited me and I was just thinking about how sexually charged it all is. And I was thinking that probably that's because of the feeling that one gets when on mushrooms or acid or something, not lion's mane or cordyceps, but the kind of, you know, the kind of mushroom that tunes you into the, the very almost sexual vibration of the entire world, which vibrates as, as a oneness, you know? So when misunderstood, it can, it can feel like sex is the point. But when properly understood, you can see that sex is pointing to something far deeper, something innate to awareness, awareness's delight at being aware of itself. That's the Shiva Shakti. So Shiva and Shakti are not two different things. Prakasha and Vimarsha are not two different things. They're two aspects of one thing. So forgive me, this, this is definitely a little technical for newcomers. But just note that I'm not saying anything more than that awareness is aware of itself. And that constitutes the highest bliss that awareness can experience. There's nothing better, friends, than being aware of being aware. And maybe it takes deep meditation to realize that. Dylan will tell you all about it, right? So there are many of you who have experienced the bliss, the bliss of simply being aware of being aware. And maybe Dylan at the end of all of this can give us an account. That bliss is unlike any bliss of the earth. And therefore, Rumi would often speak in terms of wine and sex and about the bliss of God being far deeper than those things. Though those things being somewhat metaphors for that. Okay. So this Icha Shakti, remember, is the will, the precognitive urge to play a game of self-recognition. Right? It's all about self-recognition. So that's the game of Lord Shiva. And, and thus far, I've said it has two phases. Through the Jnana and Kriya Shakti, which you know is innate to awareness, the phases of this game are Maya and the escaping of Maya. So bondage and liberation embodiment and transcendence. That's like the game that Lord Shiva plays with himself. So then what of the Spanda? What is the Spanda? So now let's get to the heart of it. You have all the philosophical infrastructure now um, to really understand one of the subtlest ideas in Kashmir Shaivism. And it's this. Spanda is not the same as Shakti, right? And I think Dominique was asking earlier, what's the relationship between Shakti and awareness? How does awareness really, oh, Shaktipat. Okay, I see. Yeah, that's a really good point, Dominique. Shaktipat seems like a change in awareness. It's not, it's a change in the mind. Right? So enlightenment is not a change in awareness. It's the mind recognizing its essential true nature. <laughs> nice. I'm just watching this exchange between Dylan and uh, our friend, um, Silicon-based life form. And he, he's accusing Dylan of being allergic to sex talk, but he's saying it's just his dog. So I'm just, I don't know. I'm very absorbed by this, this conversation in the chat right now. <laughs> so Spanda. What is the spanda? You can't call it shakti because shakti is a term that's far broader than just spanda. Properly speaking, shakti is Shiva. There's no difference between shakti and Shiva. Those, as we said earlier, are two words that mean the same thing. But if we want to go maybe one step down from that absolute understanding, that most refined understanding that shakti is Shiva, then you could say shakti is Shiva's ability to represent himself to himself or better yet, to be aware of himself through himself. So shakti is the five powers of Shiva. Of course, implied is that svatantriya shakti, that power of innate freedom. Now, these six powers, they're all shaktis. But taken together, it's called shakti. Okay, so you can't say spanda is shakti. But you can say that spanda is ananda shakti. So although consciousness is unchanging, absolutely immovable, there is something dynamic about it. 
a paradoxical sense of movement within this unmoving um, entity, okay? And that thing is called Ananda Shakti, otherwise called the Spanda. So just note, the word Ananda Shakti here, or Vimarsha, they can be used interchangeably with the word Spanda. Where did that word come from? Um, the scholar B.N. Pandit says it came first from the, uh, the, the, the master Durvasas. So Durvasas in his text, Para Shambhu Mahimna Stava, a poem to Lord Shiva. By the way, Lord Shiva not as in the meditating blue guy, but Lord Shiva in the sense of, you know, pure awareness. That, therefore, he says, Para, Para Shambhu, Supreme Shiva. And this is a Mahimna Stotra or a Mahimna Stava, a hymn praising that Supreme Shiva who is non-dual awareness. So there, Durvasas, uh, quite early on, uses the word Spanda. He uses it in book six, verses four and five. So if you want the reference, Durvasa's book six, uh, book six of Parashambhu um, Mahimna Stava. So there he says that Spanda, the vibration of Lord Shiva, is the power whereby which uh, by which he causes mind and body to move, by which he causes time, space, and causality to, to wheel around. Like this is the power of God to manifest the world like that. God being none other than pure awareness. So the word Spanda is used early on. Now, Vasugupta, a very important name for Kashmir Shaivism, because in many ways, he's like the founding teacher of Kashmir Shaivism. He's like maybe the first Kashmir Shaiva master. And give me a second. I noticed this camera doesn't have as much um, light as the other camera. So this low budget camera doesn't really, you know, it gets a little dark. So forgive me. But um, Vasugupta, apparently, the, the legend is that he had a dream. And in his dream, Lord Shiva revealed unto him the Shiva Sutra the foundational text for the Kashmir Shaiva schools of philosophy that would come after. So what happens, you know, is this. Um, Vasugupta gets a dream, and in his dream, he's taught the, the, the Shiva Sutra, and then he's told by Lord Shiva to go to a particular mountain, Mount Mahadeva. There, he's supposed to uncover a rock, and when he uncovers the rock, he finds written on the rock this Shiva Sutra. So it's kind of like this, not Shiva Sutra, sorry, this, this kind of archetypical religious story of a mystical experience in a dream being verified in waking. So anyway, Vasugupta takes these sutras, and he composes a text, which, by the way, is not his doing. It's a divinely revealed text. So it can be properly called a tantra in that it's being revealed or given by Lord Shiva. So technically the Shiva Sutra is an agama. However, in for, for scholars in the room, this is an interesting transition in the history of tantra. Because up to this point, many tantras, most tantras I would say, are tantras because they're revealed by Lord Shiva, right? So their authorship is typically unknown. It's attributed to Lord Shiva. So very rarely will you find like the author of a tantra. Like you can't name a person like Vasugupta and say that they wrote a tantra. At best, they wrote a commentary on a tantra. They wrote an exit, like what is called a, vit, a vivritti or a vimarshini or a, or a vartika like that. So you can write a commentary on a tantra uh, and you would be an exegetical author and you, you would be recognized as the commentator. But tantras have no authorship. Now Vasugupta has authored a tantra. What do we make of that? So here we already get the collapsing of Shiva and Jiva. Vasugupta, as a realized master, is none other than Shiva, a Mahasiddha. So this person, this great Siddha, this great perfected being, when that person speaks into existence a text, it's a divinely revealed text. So that's from within the religious kind of connotation of an Agama. Anyway, Shiva Sutra goes on to influence many different schools, and the Spanda is referenced there. So we first get this idea of cosmic vibration in the Shiva Sutra, okay? Now, Vasugupta would have a disciple, Bhatta Kalata from a famous family of Brahmins, the Bhattacharyas. Now, Kalata Bhatta would take the idea of the Spanda and expound upon it. And he, he famously composed the Spanda Karika, hymns of vibration, or um, as Mark Jakowski calls it, the doctrine of vibration. You know, so that, that's when Kalata Bhatta really develops the Spanda. But before him, Somananda and um, Utpala Deva, perhaps contemporaries of Bhatta Kalata, were already using that term, maybe in, influenced by the Shiva Sutra. However, they were, sorry, they weren't using the term, but they were using the concept. They called it Spurata. Spurata. Or Prasara. Prasara means supreme essence. Spurata in, in Sanskrit means like shining. So the word shining or the supreme essence. Though Utpala Deva in his Ishvara Pratyabhigya Karika doesn't actually use the word Spanda, he talks about the concept, which we're now going to explore. And prior to him, Somananda, his guru also very much liked the concept and used it often in his text, Shiva Drishti. So Shiva Drishti, Ishvara Pratyabhigya Karika, they talk about it in different terms. But of course, it's Shiva Sutra and more properly, Bhatta Kalita and his Spanda Karika that really brings this concept of the Spanda to the forefront of Kashmir Shaiva thought. Now, Abhinavagupta, slam dunk, right? Or not slam dunk, he touched down. 
he brings it all home because he does a bunch of commentaries, primarily on the Ishvara Pratyabhigya of his Guru's Guru, Utpaladeva, and there he uses the word Spanda. So he refers to the Spanda, thereby tying together what seems to be disparate traditions. So Spanda is not a school in and of itself because the word Spanda is not distinct from the concept given under a different name by the Pratyabhigya school. So to think that Pratyabhigya is a different school from the Spanda school, wrong. That's not a deep understanding. Really, the Spanda school is just using a different term for the same thing. Okay, kind of cool, right? So from an academic point of view, this is good to know. Now, what does the word Spanda actually mean? The word Spanda means throb. Actually, vibration is a, is, is, is a translation that typically gets used. But if you take Abhinava Gupta's Lakshanam, his, his implied meaning, if, if you take his um, etymology here, what you'll get is Spadi, the root, Spanda, the root of spa, the Spanda word in Sanskrit is Spadi, Kinchit, Chalane. Spadi means throb, Chalane means movement. So Spanda, its root is throbbing movement. Isn't that cute? But there's an epithet, Kinchit. It's a small throbbing movement. Spanda, kinchit, chalana. So which is it? Does it move or does it not move? Because if it moves, then however small the movement, it's still a movement, right? So if that spanda moves, then awareness changes. Then we've thus conceded, like Ramanuja, um, that awareness changes. And that comes with a slew of philosoph philosoph philosophical problems I won't get into right now. Um, maybe in the Q&A. So we don't want to admit that, obviously. We don't want to admit that awareness changes because anything that changes um, cannot be ultimately the goal because the Indian mind, I think from the very beginning, has been interested in the, the changeless, the eternal, etc. for reasons we can get into another time. So is it a movement or, or is it not? Because if it's a movement, then awareness changes, right? But it's not. It's not actually a movement. It's kinchit. The word kinchit implies that it seems like a movement. It feels like a movement. There's a dynamic quality within it, but it doesn't actually constitute a, a real movement. It's not a change in awareness. It's the fundamental nature of awareness. Just like heat is not a change in fire. You know, there's no there's no reason why heat comes from fire, is produced by fire. Heat is inextricable extricably linked to fire. Heat is the nature of fire. Similarly, spanda is the nature of pure awareness. It's that stirring, that deep stirring within. Where, where does it come from? What is that stirring, spanda? That is spadi kinchit chalane. What is that small, subtle, throbbing movement within awareness? Where from springs this dynamic sort of self-bliss, this playful, creative nature? Where does it come from? It comes from this awareness being aware of itself. So like I said earlier, this ananda shakti and the word spanda are interchangeable. Also the word vimarsha. Vimarsha means to touch oneself, somewhat lewdly, right? Mrisha, the Sanskrit word mrisha is to touch. So awareness touches itself constantly in the sense that it's always aware of itself and therefore it feels a great bliss. So because of the interplay between awareness and its self-awareness, which remember are not two entities, but one in the same movement within the same immovable entity, it creates what is called the spanda. And the spanda gives rise to all these, the icha shakti. So icha shakti, this desire, this playful urge to express oneself comes from that spanda, right? So do you see that all of this is God's play in the sense that God's great delight is being aware of herself. Since you are God, necessarily your greatest delight is being aware of yourself, which you can see manifested on every level of experience. Everyone is obsessed with the mirror, most of us at least, and we're obsessed with self um at least in the mirror, if not in our work, in our relationships. We're always looking for ourselves in others. We're looking for praise and approval from our mentors and from our friends. We're looking for a sense of belonging by seeing ourselves reflected in our colleagues. We're looking for a sense of accomplishment by getting praise. And most of all, we're looking for a sense of meaning by seeing what we've made, our work, our contributions, our legacies. And at the very least, we're looking in the mirror every morning before we leave. And some of us for exorbitant amount of times. That's not bad. In fact, that represents the very fundamental urge of awareness, the desire for awareness to be aware of itself, right? So that icha, that, that willing, the will is really the will to play the game of awareness being aware of itself. Okay, so now we come to it. The practical takeaway of that teaching. Notice that a child is inherently curious. She always wants to know new things. You know, she always wants to look under that leaf or see what's behind that corner. She's typically excited about learning, at least until the schooling system introduces the concept of grades, right? So up till then, she's excited about learning. Not only that, she's excited about doing. She wants to try her hand at stuff. She wants to fish and she wants to climb trees and she wants to you know, slap her friend and see what will happen. <laughs> she wants to draw on the wall and see what will happen. She's, she's curious and she's gregarious. So this desire to know 
the desire to learn, the desire to do, the desire to act upon the world. These are all from this basic Icha Shakti. So knowing the curiosity behind that and doing and the gregarious motive force behind that is expressing itself on every level from as early on as a child in its first few moments of life. And you can see it in animals too. Animals are curious. Animals are gregarious. You see it in nature as well in terms of what would otherwise be called inanimate particles, right? Even these seem to have this urge to do, to act upon other particles. Um, so knowing is a kind of doing and doing is a kind of knowing. We learn by doing. So all of this taken together, this urge to know and to do, that's the game that awareness plays. So it comes down to the question of renunciation. So what is that and how much effort is really involved in renunciation? So remember, you are absolutely speaking, pure non-dual awareness and nothing at all can change that. That's a given. Your pure non the absolute point of view is that you awareness are Shiva mm -hmm. and that Shiva by virtue of it being self-aware has this innate dynamic stirring, which is not quite a movement, but still experientially a throbbing movement. And that creates this like this fullness and the urge to express that fullness. Good. And that fullness creates this precognitive urge to know and to do. So necessarily that means to know and to do, I'll need a world. So from awareness, a world spring forth into, springs forth into being. And I enter into that world as a limited individual. Why? Because unless I feel myself to be a limited individual, the knowing and the doing just isn't that fun. Because as a limited individual, there are so many ways that I can know and I can do that move me away from Lord Shiva. Like, for instance, pursuing limited pleasures that are good for me as a body-mind complex. So if I want money, if I want power, if I want sexual enjoyment, these are all valid and worth having because all of them represent one phase in Lord Shiva's exploration of herself. So as I move out into the world, this is called Vishesha Spanda. Vishesha Spanda means the particularized vibration, which is a vibration of manifestation of outwardness. So Vishesha Spanda is, the, is, is what typically in science is called a vibration because it moves out. But in science, vibration moves out into space, right? A vibration is a movement in space. Whereas this is not that. Space itself is emanated forth from this Vishesha Spanda. So in that way, it's different from science, right? It's not physical movement. It's a spiritual movement that can perhaps be seen in reflex in all the physical movements in the universe. So everything in the universe is vibrating. Any quantum mechanics person can tell you that. And that vibration is called the Vishesha Spanda. Maybe I'll put it in the chat. Vishesha um, Spanda, which means the outward throb, or maybe more literally, it's the particularized throb, which is extroversive and um, expressive outward. So these are all ways to understand Vishesha Spanda, the outward extroversive manifestation of a particular world experience. So from pure awareness, driven by the Spanda, this playful urge to self-express, moving through the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, skin, a world springs into being. And in that world appear many objects that seem desirable to me, money, power, sex, etc. And I live a life oriented, oriented towards those. That's Vishesha Spanda. Right? Then as a result of all of this, this is called the, the Shakti expression, the imminent expression. And as a result of being in the world, I, I learn ultimately that these things don't make me happy. So then I do what is the other direction, which is called the movement towards sam, sa, ma, ya, spanda. Samaya spanda is the general, literally general throb, but it's introversion. Um, it's... It's, it's um, inward, and I guess you could say it's contemplative. So the moment a person becomes philosophical, the moment they become reflective and they ask, the self, and they ask themselves this question, am I really getting off here? Am I really getting out of this world what I thought I could get out of it? Am I really happy? Am I truly fulfilled? The moment they start asking those questions, they generally come to spiritual life, right? And spiritual life is this samaya spanda, this movement inward towards purusha. So if we look at this again, and this is the last model I'll put up on the screen. We're quite a bit over time. And I hope you don't mind. I recognize that it takes me about an hour 30 to finish saying what I really need to say. So I'm coming up to the end of this now. But notice, as we said earlier, there's a subject, an I am, and an object, the idam. So the movement from the subject to the object is called vishesha spanda, the extrovertive outward movement towards um, expression, objective experience, right? So that the, the, the senses 
pour forth a world and that world is full of objects that I desire. And when I move out into the world to acquire those objects, that's called the Vishesha Spanda, the outward throb. Then the inward throb is called Samaya Spanda, the Shiva aspect. And that's when I head towards the subject. So now I might become interested in like yoga, in meditation, which is a dissolution of the world and an inward kind of indrawn experience of the self. So when the world dissolves, the self blazes forth in all of its glory. And when the world expands, the self seems to diminish. In other words, when I'm busy with my thoughts and my life and, and my sensations, I seem to lose touch with awareness. And when I'm fully aware in deep samadhi, for instance, I seem to lose touch of the world, of sensation, of thought, of emotion. So life then, both spiritual and material, both bondage and liberation, is really just an ebb and flow, a throb from moment to moment between objective awareness and subjective awareness, between vishesha spanda, particularized vibration, and samaya spanda, general vibration. But notice, aham and idam are two aspects of one thing. The world and Shiva are not different from one another. Awareness manifests itself as a world. And the way it does that, we'll talk about next week. Next week, we'll talk about the reflection theory, abhasa vada, the, the way that the world can manifest without, um, without consciousness itself being changed, right? That we'll talk about next week. A very technical and beautiful discussion um, that I think gets to the very root of the Indian philosophical problems of parinama versus vivarta vada, like that. That's for next week. But notice, awareness is fluctuating between world and awareness, but those fluctuations are not happening in time. Time and space are subject to it. So it's both a world and awareness at the same time. Just like fire is both heat and fire at the same time. Shiva is Shakti and Shakti is Shiva at the same time. So in your individual experience though, it feels like it's an either or. Like you could pulse out into the world or you can pulse in into awareness. And so many of our practices in spiritual life is about the pulsing in to awareness. Do you see? So taken together, if you take Samaya Spanda together with Vishesha Spanda, if you put Shiva and Shakti together, what you end up getting is called Para Spanda. Para Spanda means Supreme Spanda. Now, Dylan, you can see how we can map this on to an even greater trinity of Para, 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 and Apara. There is the Para Spanda, which is Para, and that's the uh, Supreme subject, Shiva. Then there is Maya, and that's Para, Para. And through Maya, there appears first and foremost the Vishesha Spanda of the first set of para, 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 and apara. So that first triangle is now within a larger triangle. One of the vertices of that triangle is the small triangle of Purusha, Prakriti, and the instruments between them, right? And then the larger triangle is this para spanda, Shiva and Shakti in perfect fusion. The para, para, um, yes, there is no infinite regress. Exactly, because you do have this ultimate subject, Shiva. And you can't go beyond that because as long as you are aware of it, it's an object to you. But you being aware of yourself, um, there's no infinite regress there because you're not aware of any particular object. You're aware of awareness itself. So infinite regress only happens with objects, not with subjects. That's called anavasta in Sanskrit, infinite regress. Okay, I digress. Now, here's what we have. We have the idea that pure awareness, because of its self-reflexive ability, is endowed with this stirring called the spanda, which causes it to pulse or throb outward into manifestation and to pulse or throb inward into um, pure subjective non-dual consciousness. Both of these throbs are two movements of the same reality, just as heat and fire belong to the same entity. Okay, so what does this mean for you? Notice that the sex act, as far as it concerns bodies, is really a dra dramatization of the spanda. In one sense, the desire to connect with another individual as a body and as a mind is a desire to know thyself through another, is to, ref to see oneself reflected in another. In essentially, it's yamala. Yamala means joining, two things coming together to be resolved into one. And that is an urge felt not only on like the sexual libidinous level, it's an urge felt all throughout nature on the, on the particle level. On the molecular level, the urge to like join. Okay, so we realize ultimately that joining bodies doesn't satisfy us. So no amount of sexuality can ultimately be satisfying, though it's a period of like exploration that needs to happen to come to that conclusion. Then no amount of minds joining could ever be ultimately satisfying too. So finally, what we want is the joining of awareness. To connect with someone else requires that we connect from the level of awareness to awareness. But ah, wasn't there only one awareness? As such, if only one awareness exists, 
then I already contain within me the goal of all sexuality, the goal of all romance, the goal of all striving, which ultimately was to get a glimpse of my true non-dual nature. That alone constitutes the highest bliss. So because awareness being aware of itself is the highest bliss, therefore the game of being aware of oneself is ultimately the Shiva Lila. And that game has two phases, as I said, the, the phase of forgetting and the phase of awakening. The first is called Nigraha, um, forgetting oneself. And the other one is called Anugraha, revealing oneself to oneself. So how much effort is there really in renunciation? In one sense, none at all, because you're already free. And this whole thing is a game played in freedom. Kintu Durgata Karitvat, Svachandya Nirmala Daso, Svatma Prachadana Krida, Pandita Parameshwara. Lord Shiva is ever skilled at disguising his true nature, Krida, as a game, without ever once losing his independence and freedom. So the absolute truth is never compromised. You are Shiva before, now, and always. Nothing will change your Shiva nature. You can never lose, really lose your Shiva nature, nor can you really gain your Shiva nature. You are that now. However, through a playful attitude, you pretend not to be Shiva. And how long do you pretend not to be Shiva? As long as it's fun for you not to be Shiva. As long as you continue to enjoy limited pleasure in things like sex, money, power, right? But once you start craving something bigger, some much more fulfilling pleasure, naturally there's this movement, it seems, away from the particularized individual towards the general. In other words, away from the Jiva and towards Shiva. Away from the personal and towards the transpersonal. Now that movement is called the movement of renunciation. Because what do you renounce? You renounce anything that might be good for the particular in order to embrace your identity as the transpersonal. Why is renunciation important? Primarily because of this. The more you act out of a lack of renunciation, in other words, the more you act out of rati, lust or desire, the more you reify your identity as that particular individual, which is part of the fun. But if you mean to go back to your transpersonal nature, which you already are, then you're going to need to do something that is vastly different from the way you've been doing it thus far. Right? Thus far, the way you've been living your life is as an individual. That, how's that worked out? Right? So we come to spiritual life because we're looking for a new way to think, a new way to feel, a new way to experience the world. A way that's more aligned with the ultimate nature of reality. And therefore, renunciation is the ultimate urge of Maya. It's the ultimate urge of every individual. So we would say, just as a flower emits fragrance when it blooms, a spiritual practitioner, their fragrance is renunciation. Because that what it means is that they're blooming into the real realization that they're not this particular individual and that they are all individuals. So now we come to effortless effort. How much effort is involved? Well, as much as it would be fun for you, you see. So it's all a game, remember. But if you get close enough to it, your renunciation becomes more and more intense because the bliss of being aware of being aware so absorbs your mind that you can't think of anything that's not that. You won't settle for any pleasure less than that. But this is contingent upon you having glimpsed that. So unless you glimpse that bliss of being self-aware, the taste for other kinds of bliss won't go away. So therefore we say in one sense, renunciation is spontaneous. By the grace of awareness, anugraha, one comes to be aware of being aware, maybe in deep meditation or maybe through contact with holy people or maybe just through reading a book or some random event. Like it could be a tragedy, it could be a miracle, whatever. By some means, a person comes to taste spiritual bliss. The degree to which they taste that will affect the degree to which they renounce anything that's not that bliss. So in that sense, renunciation is effortless. However, um, some integration and some stabilization is required. On that level, there's some effort. So there's some effort not to backslide into patterns that you now know full well, give you some pleasure, but not all pleasure. So renunciation, therefore, is the movement from limited pleasure or particularized pleasure to expansive pleasure, you see? And then there's one final movement. Once you hit that Samaya Spanda, that supreme transpersonal vibration, then like Sri Ramakrishna, one opens one eye, one's eyes and sees the very world that you throbbed away from you now throb towards, but as Shiva, not as a Jiva. So now your movement towards the world will be the movement of expressing a world, not the movement of trying to get for yourself limited objects in that world, which you don't feel responsible for having created. So the ultimate realization is that this is your world because the world is not different from you. It's a spanda, an emanation, an expression of you. So what does it feel like to be in that state? It's like super sexual joy. And these are not my words. These are Swami Lakshmanju's words. So Swami Lakshmanju, when describing the ultimate state in Kashmir Shaivism, says it's super sexual joy. Why does he use that phrase? Because it's not transcendent only. It's not like a blank, spacious, Shiva only experience. Rather, it's an embodied, um, full, pulsating, throbbing experience of dynamic joy. 
much like sexuality. But unlike sexuality, it's a far more fulfilling, far more all-encompassing experience, you know? And it's not over in a couple of minutes. So the important thing about this spanda, uh, as Swami Lakshmanju describes it, is that phrase, super sexual joy. So we call this in um, the technical language, right? The, the Kaula Trika calls it this, uses this language. Vishvo Mayam Atma Tattva Iti Kaula. By definition, the kaula, the realization, is the self expressed in everything, the all-pervasive nature of the self. So it's not about dissolving the world. It's about recognizing that you are embodied as the world. And the experience of that level of embodiment is a pulsing, is a throbbing, is this kind of like sensual, orgasmic sort of state um, that it fills one with such a bliss that all other lower blisses fall away. But to get to that taste, to awaken to that taste, which is more than just peace. It's an embodied bliss. It's a rapture. To get to that, some effort is required. But notice that effort, though it's happening on the level of the body and mind, is not in contrast or contradictory to the effortless sense of pure being. So the interplay of spanda, of effort and effortlessness, is just outward and inward throbbing. You see, so they're not different. They're rather two reflexes of the same. So hopefully, to some extent, we've resolved the wu-wei thing. Okay, to what extent? I don't know. You can tell me in the Q&A. And I hope, I think, um, I think that's enough for today. So I hope you enjoyed it. It's important to recognize in closing, when we talk about the um, reflection theory next week, that awareness has not changed. What's changed is the way awareness is representing itself to itself. And that does not constitute a change in awareness. So to put it all together, the ultimate sexual experience is not the yamala, the union of bodies, nor is it the union of minds. It's the union of awareness with itself through the process of self-reflection. And already that is happening with each breath, with each word, with each moment. Already there is available to you the oceanic nectar of pure non-dual bliss, which you can be constantly sipping, perhaps from the bottle of the mantra. And you will so sway and stagger that people will take you to be a drunk. For yours is no ordinary wine, friends. Yours is the wine of everlasting bliss. The wine of tasting your own glory, your own non-dual splendor as the one who includes all things, transcends all things, and embodies itself as all things. Sex is thus superfluous for you who are already united with all. Om Kintu Durgata Karitvat Svachandya Nirmala Daso Svatma Prachadana Kreera Pandita Parameshwara Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tatsat Shri Ram Krishna Rapanamastu Om, peace, peace, peace.